Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 7. And then Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> this is the message that um, God had kind of led me to last week. And I had it mostly ready. And I got here last Sunday and God just sort of opened up something different for me to preach. And so I did. And... Um, so I prayed about it, and I, I came back to these notes. And the more I thought about it, the better it got, and was able to add more scripture to it. Um, for those of you who are visiting, don't know me very well. Uh, what you're going to hear from this pulpit is a lot of God, and hopefully very little of me. Um, I love to preach, and I like to talk about God and learn about God and teach others about God. God has a nature about him, and that nature and character is known and revealed to us by the scriptures. There are things that God will do. There are things that God will never do. You believe that? Say amen. amen. One of the things that God will never do is be defiled with uncleanness. Right? One of the things that God will never do is allow a person to go on sinning all their life. Let them get away with everything they want to do with no repentance, no sorrow whatsoever, and then allow them into the gates of heaven simply because they came from a higher up family than everybody else. God won't do that either. And another thing about the nature and character of God revealed to us, and when I started searching this out, it, it dawned on me that theme is all through the Bible. You're going to be hard-pressed to find a book of the Bible that does not in some way teach this lesson. And I'll share with you what that is in a moment. First, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Everybody have their Bible there? Say amen. We're going to start in verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, I, I remember reading this one day and I'm going, ooh, that looks like a list. I wonder how many names are in that list. So I thought I was going to be real smart and count them all. So I counted the Hittites, Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivyasites, and the Jebusites. And I went, there's seven of them. And look at the next phrase, seven nations. I went... I was right, wasn't I? <laughs> See, God just makes it simple for you. If you don't know how to count, he'll just tell you. There's seven nations. And I want you to think about that number seven in the Bible. The dragon that John saw in Revelation 12 had seven heads. The beast in Revelation 13 had seven heads. Now, if we were to do a comparison, you could say that everything that the devil and the Antichrist is is an opposite of what God is. God is holy. The Antichrist is the man of sin, the son of perdition. Uh, God cannot lie, but the devil is the father of lies. They're opposites. And in Isaiah chapter 2, Revelation chapter 4, and then other less conspicuous places in the Bible, you find out that the Holy Spirit is actually, there are seven spirits that make up the Holy Spirit. And they're, they're actually listed in Isaiah chapter 1, or Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. You find all seven of those spirits in Isaiah 11, 2. You can look at that later. So whenever I see on the dragon, which is the devil, 
seven heads, whenever I see on the beast having seven heads, and then I look at these seven nations, and they were godless, evil nations, and there are seven of them. When you go read the story of Mary Magdalene, you find out that she had seven devils in her and Jesus cast them out. You also find what Jesus taught. He said if an unclean spirit leaves somebody and is gone and he decides he's going to come back, he finds the house swept and garnished and that's a person's life, but when he comes back, if he's let in, he'll bring seven others worse than him with him. So on one hand, the number seven would represent God's perfection, God's Holy Spirit, and the seven spirits of God. But then on this hand, you've got seven heads, uh, seven crowns, you've got seven devils, seven evil nations, and so on and so on and so on. So there's a, a contrast there. God said seven nations greater and mightier than thou. These are, the, these are the people now that when you read Numbers 13, you find, and some people have a big problem with this, because God ordered the killing of every man, woman, and child. Now, some people look at that and say, well, that's, a, that's, that's an evil God. I wouldn't worship him. What they don't understand is that land had become so defiled when Moses sent the 12 spies in in Numbers chapter 13. They come back and what did they report? Who was in that land? Giants. And the sons of Anak who came from the giants. They're all over the place in that land. We don't think we can, we don't think we can fight them and, and live. So that's what that represents. Now look at God's instructions to us. When the Lord thy God shall deliver them from before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Now watch this in verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son. Nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. When I was growing up here in this church, Lisa and I grew up here, we were taught by our pastor that when it comes to dating and marriage, number one, you should never date anybody that you would not marry. Number two, you should not marry somebody who does not believe what you believe. You know what? He was right. Because I can tell you, when God put Lisa and I together, we're like two different people. But when I look back on the years of my life with the wife that God has given me, I realize that God has used her more than once to save me. She's the reason I'm still here today. And she grew up in this church like I did. She heard the same preaching I did. She believed the same things I did. And God put it together. But God said, when you see their daughters, don't let your sons marry their daughters. When you see their sons... Don't let their sons take your daughters. Um, and he said, verse 4, For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Now, I want you to understand now and, and, and see where I'm going with this. These seven nations that are in this land, what is God going to do with them? What is he going to do with them? He's going to destroy them. 
And if any of the Jews had married in to those people, what would have happened to them? They would have been destroyed right along with the Hivites and the Girgashites and the Canaanites and the flea bites and the tick bites. And God didn't want that. He didn't want it. He's saying there's only room in this land for one people to live. I'm giving you this land as I promised to Abraham your father, to Isaac your father, to Jacob your father. I gave them this land. This land is now your inheritance. But if you want to succeed in this land, you need to rid these people out of that land. Or if your son starts marrying their daughters, and then they start having children, which are your grandchildren, you will find it nearly impossible to do what I told you to do with those people. Because you'd have to end up killing your own grandchild. Who would do that? Well, God's wise, isn't he? If we would have listened to God when we were 13, 14, 15, 16, we could have avoided a lot of trouble that came in our lives, couldn't we? God was telling us all along. We just didn't want to hear it. Now turn to Romans chapter 1. And when you get there, we'll pause a minute. We'll have a word of prayer. I do appreciate you coming. I really do. You know, we haven't done this in a long time. Is that camera right there? Everybody turn around and look at that camera and wave everybody. And say... Boy, we wish you were here, too. Oh, I was going to read the announcements, too, and I forgot to do that. Uh, we do have a, a time every year in August. We call it a Bethel Homecoming. All the folks that are online that watch us, uh, a lot of them will be coming in at that time, so looking forward to that. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, once again, we come before you, Father, and we lay all of our troubles and our problems at your feet. Father, we're deserving of nothing except hell, fire, and judgment. If we, were have to, if we were to have to stand in front of this congregation this morning and confess every one of our sins, God, we just, we don't want to do that. You don't require that. But you do require a broken heart about our sins. And Father, we pray, dear God, that you would cause us to listen. Cause us to take heed to your word. To listen to the wisdom that you have written in this book. Profound wisdom that the best Sages, the best scholars in the world and the best philosophers have never been able to figure out nor understand. And yet, there are people in this church who can barely read. They understand it way better than the college professor does because they believe it by faith. And that's one of those spirits that you gave us, one of the fruits of the Spirit. So, Father, increase our faith today. Warn us about getting involved with certain people. Warn us and deliver us when we have joined and linked together with people that we shouldn't be with. God, separate your people the way your word tells us to separate. In, the, in doing that, Father, then that will clear us of any guilt that we may have on us and it will protect us if we are not partakers of their sins Father you will bless us so that we're not partakers of your wrath on them so Father drill that into our heart this morning to be very cautious in this world that we live in 
on who we link up to, who we hook up to, who we follow online, what preacher preaches to us, and so on and so on. Lord, just give us understanding. Give us strength, Father, in these days we live in. Separate us, remove us, Father, from the things of this world because you told us to love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. Bless your word today in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. I want you to look in Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, Paul is like teaching this, this brand new New Testament covenant that God now offers to all of mankind. It's not just to the Jews. It's to all mankind. And it's a, it is different than the covenant of Moses, where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and God said, see all these commandments? If you do these commandments, I'll let you live. If you break these commandments, you'll die. The, our new covenant is different than that. Because God knows that our flesh is incapable of serving God, and it's incapable of not breaking the law. We were, Lindsay and I were trying to hook the um, washer and dryer up yesterday. And it's a little tiny space between the dryer and the wall. And I said, Lindsay, I don't fit down there so well. So I tied her on the end of a fishing pole and I reeled her down in there. And so she, was, she fit right down in there. And I was looking over the top of the dryer like this. I was going to hand her a screwdriver. And I pulled up my head like that. And my head hit the top of the cabinet there, the sharp edge of that cabinet. And I'm just going, ah, 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 that hurt. And she was laughing. And I said, I've got cuss words in my mouth. <laughs> but I swallowed them. It's not that we don't know how to sin. We know how. God just wants us to be different. Amen? So, Romans chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, they show us that everybody on the earth, when it comes to sin, is exactly the same. Now, some... There's always somebody who likes to judge everybody. There's probably somebody online listening to me say that. I'm going, they're going, well, if you were any type of saved person, that wouldn't even come to your mind. Uh, excuse me. My flesh is just as rotten and wicked as everybody else is. And it's not in the strength of my flesh that inhibits or prohibits me from doing what's wrong. It's the power of God that keeps me from it. And besides that, I don't sit around and practice saying cuss words all day long. Because if you do, they're going to roll out one day when a bunch of people stand in there. That's just human nature. So he tells us in these chapters that everybody's the same. Everybody's, you know, some guy, well, that guy commits adultery. I, I, I don't think we all have that kind of people in our church. Well, that's true. But then uh, what about the people who cheat on their taxes? Oh, those are legal write-offs. I checked with my accountant. No, you're cheating. And that's what Paul said. The adulterer looks at the thief and says, you should not steal. Well, the thief looks at the adulterer and says, thou should not commit adultery. And the truth of it is, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans chapter 3. But what about... There are those who practice sin... And then there are those who, by reason of association, are just as guilty as those who committed the sin. Come and correct me if I'm wrong on this, okay? Let's say that, um, let's say that uh, me and, and Ron and Gary and... Um, Anthony back there, let's say that 
we all decided we're going to go joyriding at 1 o'clock in the morning. Okay? So we're driving around Festus and Crystal City. And all of a sudden, Anthony says, hey, stop up here, guys. There's an old friend I want to go see you up there. Okay, we stop. Anthony goes in for about five minutes, comes back out. And that was quick. Oh, it didn't last long. He just said hi. Well, then Cubby comes up behind us and pulls us over. And he asked me, I'm the driver, he asked me, is there any drugs in the car? No, nah, we don't do drugs. Well, I'm going to have you step out. You mind if I do a search? No, go ahead. Well, what we didn't know was Anthony ran in an apartment up there and bought a bunch of methamphetamine, had it in the car. Now, he's not going to admit to it. I'm not going to admit to it. Gary's not going to admit to it. Ron's not going to admit to it. So in the eyes of the law, Cubby, who gets charged with it? All four of us are going to jail. Because it was in the car. But I didn't do the drugs. I didn't buy them. It's guilt by association. And if Anthony doesn't fess up, it's going to be a contest if we can get the most expensive lawyer to get out of it. But in the eyes of the law, you're guilty by association. Guilt by association. Is that a real thing in God's word? Well, what did God say back in Deuteronomy 7? He said, see these seven nations? Not only do I want you to destroy them, I don't want your families mixing with their families. And you know why? Because your granddaughters then are going to learn about their gods. I saw a post this morning on Facebook in our Bethel Church Facebook group where a lady is asking us to pray for one of her daughters who her sister is going to hold a coming out party for. Her. And I wrote a comment and I said, believe it or not, that is more common than we realize. It is affecting literally every family in America, somehow, some way. And it's getting worse. And there are just things, people, that as even our own relatives get worse, that should just say to us, we need to get farther and farther away from them. You see, the Bible tells us that we can be in the world but not of the world. Now, Romans chapter 1. Let's read this. If you didn't believe the last verse, maybe you'll believe this one. Romans 1, 28. And Romans 1 talks about the people who disregarded the gospel of Jesus Christ and exchanged the glory of God for idols. And so God said in verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You know, that's one of my biggest fears. Is that any time I disobey God, I get scared and beg God, God, please don't turn me over to be a reprobate. God gave them over to, be a, to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And then he said, being filled with all unrighteousness, Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. Listen. When a woman can take herself to an abortion mill and tell that doctor paying thousands of dollars to rip the child out of her womb and murder it for her, that woman is without natural affection. There are beasts in the earth that have more love for their offspring than humans do. 
Mama lions will fight a male lion to the death to protect her cubs. Oh, I said cubs, didn't I? <laughs> so you got these people doing all these sins without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God. Now watch this. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. So number one, you've got a list here of 23 things that if you commit just one of them, God's biblical judgment on you is the death penalty. It is eternal damnation in the lake of fire. And I don't want to go there. But it's not just those who do those things. Who knows, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. In other words, you purposely chose to associate with certain people because the sins they commit. And you kept yourself, even when you found out what they do, you stayed in friendship and fellowship and association with those people. Not offering them the gospel, not saying that they can leave those things behind and serve God, not warn them about hell, and the Bible says that you are just as guilty as they are. What have we seen on television in the last 40 years? We've seen on American television the rise of the sodomite. Right now on most TV shows in this country that air on national television, there's at least one sodomite in every one of them and now they're doing it with Nickelodeon and Disney Plus kid shows. Pushing transgenders on these young children. Folks, that's the definition of the word pervert. If you let your kids watch that junk, is that not also guilt by association. Well, I watch it because they're funny. You know, I used to think, I used to watch Andy Griffith. And there was a character in Andy Griffith. He'd be in about every three shows, one out of every three shows. His name was Otis. Remember Otis? What was Otis? The town drunk. And he'd come slobbering into the jail, grabbed the key and unlocked the cell, put himself in it, hang the key up, and lay down and sleep it off. And everybody thinks that's all funny. Till you find out one episode that he's actually got a wife and kids at home. And now that just, that just, it's not funny to me anymore. It doesn't, doesn't make me laugh. Not when you think of the reality of how close to home that hits with a lot of families in this country. Dads not coming home at night, going out and getting drunk. So drunk that they have checked themselves into the city jail every night to sleep it off. Who's raising their children? Who's out playing ball with their sons? Who's baking a cake with their mother? It's not happening. God said, not only, who know in the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And God is teaching here the doctrine of separation and the doctrine of whatever you are a partaker of, you will receive what God hands down to them. Let me make that clear. Turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, I'm going to move fast now. Verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, 
Consent thou not. If they say, come with us, come join with us. Let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up as alive, alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. And so all of a sudden, some teenage boy, he's in a church. His mom and daddy are faithful to the church. They love the Lord their God. They're praying for the children every day. But this, this one teenage son, he ends up falling in with the wrong crowd. And all of a sudden now he's out with these boys one night when they do a robbery. Because they told him, if you'll do the driving, we'll run in, we'll steal the money, we come back out, we'll give you a part of it. Did you know he's just as guilty under the law as the guys that went in that place and stole that money? He partook in the sins of his friends. Therefore, according to God, he then will be a partaker of their judgment as well. Verse 15, he says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. You know what that's saying there? That all the lifestyle that they're living, the biggest harm that it's doing is to themselves. They're just, they're just condemning their own soul to hell. They late for their own blood. They look privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Robberies, armed robberies, thugs on the street, Dare I, dare I say, the deal in Ferguson, Missouri a couple years ago, where a cop having to defend his own life had to shoot a man, which earlier that day, strong arm robberied a convenient mark. And to this day, there are still people who side with him. I don't care if he's white, black. I don't care, I don't care what color he is. If he did wrong, it's still wrong, no matter what race you're from. Proverbs 4.14 Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. If there are places that you recognize now that you really can't go to those places anymore, then I wouldn't even drive by them anymore. I'd go out of my way to stay away from them. If Roy were here, I would say that, yo, Roy, he would tell you. If he thought he could have another drink tonight and not end up drinking the whole bottle, he'd do it. But he knows that if I, he just took one drink, it would destroy him forever, and he knows it. Verse 16, for they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light. Here's the contrast now. That shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. So you're seeing a picture of two types of people here. Those who walk in darkness and those who walk in the light. And when you, listen to me, when you walk in in, when you walk in the light, all of these issues that come up on the news where they're trying to divide us all, you see right through that. 
And you say, you know what? If we just had us some preachers on all day TV instead of CNN, maybe we could turn this whole country around. Maybe the whites, the blacks, the Latinos, the Orientals, maybe all of those people in America would get right with God and we wouldn't have to deal with this nonsense. But see, what's happening is is that everybody seeks their own and you got people who stand up for other people who are nothing but wicked, vile, evil people. And when you stand up for them or when you join their cause, God says you're just as guilty as they are. There should be a clear difference between light. Turn to Genesis 1. Verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. What did he do? He divided light from darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And let me here tell you something. There is no dark in light, and there is no light in dark. You're like me and my wife. I like dark meat. She won't touch it. She wants white meat. And I don't care much for chicken breasts. I think they're too dry. So when we go to KFC, it's the Civil War all over again. But I, I make sure she gets her white meat, but I want my dark meat. When you associate with people who are clearly in the wrong biblically, if you're a born-again Christian, your first loyalty is not to your countrymen or to your race. Your first loyalty is to Jesus Christ. That's your first priority. Now, Proverbs 5. My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion, that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman... Drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Ladies, if you saw some pretty gal flirting with your husband, you just going to let it go? No. You're going to catch her off guard as she's walking. You're going to trip her. <laughs> or worse. The lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. And I'm, t I'm here to tell you people, God absolutely knew what he was doing when he put it in my heart to reach out to Miss Lisa Leonard because I probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her. My wife wants to go to heaven. My wife wants her family to go to heaven with her. Had I chosen another woman, I might have chosen a strange woman whose feet and steps go right to hell. Let's, all right, verse uh, 8. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. That means stay away from her. Lest thou give thine honor unto others. You know what? I'm going to stop here for a second. I'm going to address a very uncomfortable issue. But it is an issue that must be dealt with. The number one destruction mechanism that the devil uses in every family 
is pornography. It is the number one means of destroying the American family. You know what men have said to their wives? Honey, you just don't do it for me anymore. I just, I just don't think you're as pretty as you used to be. And I can almost guarantee you that man's had his head in his phone looking at things that he ought not and then comparing his wife to that. That's wicked. Can I get an amen out of God's people? It's uncomfortable. We don't like to talk about it. It's got to be dealt with. Verse 9, Lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, How have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof. And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to hear them that instructed me. And you know what, what's going on here is, whoever this is, is saying, Boy, I wish I'd have listened to God. But now it's too late. The rich man and Lazarus, when the rich man lifted up his eyes and he was in torments in hell, do you think that if God would have sent a rope down to pull him out, you think he would have got on it? He wanted out of that place. But I'm here to tell you people, according to the Bible, once you're there, you're staying. Psalm 50, verse 16. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind me. Well, I like that stuff. People that will not read their Bible for no reason, and all of a sudden they see something on Facebook that they don't like, and all of a sudden they start quoting Scripture. And God says, what are you doing quoting scripture? That was the last book on your mind yesterday. Verse 18, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him and hast been partakers with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to... There was a, an article that came out on the, one of these web news sites here a few years ago. And I think it was out of, out of the United Kingdom, out of England. And the author of the article wrote that it's very likely that if you visited a porn site on the internet, it's very likely that hackers will hack into that database and, and make public your IP address and the date and the time when you visited that site. And then put it as public record on the internet. And I started reading the comments underneath that article that people left. You know what nine out of ten people said? Well, if anybody wants a list of my porn sites, I'll just tell you where I go. I don't care. That's the attitude now of most people. They're not ashamed anymore. Those are the people you've got to stay away from. Verse 19, Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. But you've got to be willing to come out and be different than everybody else. Jeremiah 51, verse 40. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, God said. Like rams with he goats. How is Shishak taken? And how is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? 
The sea has come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land, and a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth, neither doth any son of man pass thereby. Who is the son of man? Jesus. You know what he's describing, Gary? He's describing any place that you'll never find Jesus. He'll never be there. Which, sadly to say, could very well be churches in this town. Places where Jesus will never walk in that place. He's not welcome there. And so God says, in Revelation 18, He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. And the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, now here it is, underline this. Come out of her, my people. What did the two angels, what were they charged to do when God sent the two angels to the city of Sodom? What were they charged to tell Lot? Lot, if you'll just come down to their level, well, you could win them for God. That's not what he said, is it? What did they tell him? Lot, God's going to destroy this place tomorrow morning. And if you don't want to get destroyed with them, you better be ready to follow us. We're going to lead you to safety. And anybody that wants to come. So talk to your sons-in-law. Talk to your daughters. Talk to your wife. Well, the two sons-in-law, they stayed. Lot's wife went, but... No sooner than they got out of the city, she turned around, looked back, turned into a pillar of salt. But God meant what he said. You want to hold on to Sodom that bad? If you're going to be a partaker of her sins, then I'm going to make you a partaker of her wrath. And you're not going to like it. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. In other words, God's going to give a double portion of his wrath. If you ever want to get a good picture of the wrath of God, you read these stories in the Old Testament about how God had Israel slaughter those people. Cut them up bad. Left their bodies to be dung piles in the field. You understand that, don't you? The, all the wild beasts came out and ate them. And the next day, what are they? Dung in the field. And God said, if you choose to stay with them, that's going to happen to you. Whose side are you going to be on? What we've got nowadays is that churches are so eager to put bodies in the pews that they've compromised just about every doctrine of the Bible in order to get them in and not offend anybody, don't hurt anybody's feelings, and don't tell them all this judgment stuff because they don't want to hear that. It doesn't matter what they want to hear. That's exactly what they need. I used, to, I used to try that with my mom. I would say, Mom, I don't want a whipping. Mom said, I don't care what you want. You're getting a whipping. And she gave me one. Turn to 2 Corinthians 6. I'll be done. Our Bible is, a, is life's guidebook. Some famous philosopher said it would be easy if we just had a handbook on how to live life. 
but we don't. And I'm going, yeah, we do. It's called a Bible. It is God's instructions to mankind that if you will live the way God tells you to live, I promise you, you'll be far happier. Our dear friend, Tim Barron's, will go specifically, when he gets to Las Vegas, he will go into all the gay bars that he can find. And he goes in there and he talks to the bartender. And he says, do I have your permission to hand out a free movie on suicide in this bar? And the bartender always says, you've come to the right place. Most of these guys that come in here, it's like a year later, you won't see them. They went and hanged themselves or shot themselves in the head. And they want you to think that their lifestyle is so great a lifestyle. But I've never found anybody satisfied with that lifestyle. I've never found anybody happy in it. You know why? It goes against the direct nature of God. So God says this, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That applies in the church you're going to. That applies who you're going to marry. That applies to what groups you're going to join in with. It applies to what business partners you may select to help you run a business. In fact, there is not a single aspect of our lives that this idea right here does not apply to. There are no exceptions to this rule. In what era, whatever area of life you decide to yoke yourself with unbelievers, you are now unequally yoked. And you might say, well, in doing this, I'm hoping to turn them to Jesus. But the reality is, the yoke is unequal. And they have the more strength. And, and rather than you bringing them to the wells of salvation, they are going to drag you to the pits of hell. Being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And the answer is none. What communion hath light with darkness? We read that in Genesis 1. None. What concord or agreement hath Christ with Belial, who is Satan? None. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Is God going to let everybody into heaven? No. Neither then would God be happy with you yoking yourselves to people who are going to hell. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, this is what he says, come out from among them and be ye separate. That's not saith the Mike. That's not saith the hoggard. That is saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters saith the Lord God Almighty. Now the message is very simple. Young people, we were taught, my sister, myself, my wife, we were taught in this church, don't marry somebody that's lost. If you do, it will always cause problems. It always will. And in that sense, you have a house divided. What happens to a house that is divided against itself? It does not stand. Now, I know, listen, I know lots of people. I'm not, I am not 
coming down on anybody with something that I would stand up here and say, I'm glad I've never been guilty of this, because I have. I'm just simply telling you, don't make these mistakes. With whatever you choose to hook up into in your life, and they're not right with God, more than likely, you, instead of them being made partakers of the heavenly calling, you will be made a partaker of God's wrath because of their influence on your life. There was a time when I was young. Lisa and I hadn't been married very long. I worked with her brother every day. And there was a time when I wanted to kind of follow his lifestyle. And he said that to me once. Steve said that to me once. He said, you know, you first started working here. I didn't, I didn't think I want to work with you. He said, you've kind of come around a little bit. And when he said that, that scared me. That I had so much compromised my testimony with this lost man that instead of him wanting to be saved, it was the other way around. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm glad to say now that that same man is in heaven because after God dealt with me, God used me to deal with him. And when he passed away, he walked into streets of glory. Somebody say amen. It can happen, people. It can happen to the strongest of us, the best of us. It can happen. Avoid it. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to have a word of prayer in a minute. I don't know who I'm preaching this to. don't know who... Who needed it? I know I did. But if God's dealing with your heart today, I don't drag out the altar call. Sometimes I don't have one. But if you've got something on your heart you don't want to come down and pray about, you just come on down here. I wouldn't have to beg you because if God's moving in your heart, you're going to do it anyway. But I want you to take these thoughts and these words home with you. Think about where you are in life and where you need to be. Are you hooked up with God's people and linked with them? Or have you hooked up with the lost, joined in fellowship with them? Because if you have, then you're in real danger of being a made, made a partaker of God's wrath. And you don't want that. Father, come before you today. I thank you, God, for giving me the liberty and the grace to be able to preach this message. Father, I have not told these people anything that I myself have not been guilty of at least one time in my life. It is my nature, God. You made me this way to want to be liked by groups of people. And I find myself conforming to them easily to get people to like me. But Father, you've shown me through some really good men in my life that it's not my job to be liked by everybody. It is my job to proclaim, thus saith the Lord. It is to proclaim and to warn sinners of God's wrath and to warn believers not to compromise for the sake of those who are hellbound. Because in doing so, they make themselves partakers of your wrath. 
Father, whoever this was for, for whatever reason, you had me preach it. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bring a double portion of their life. They would see it in themselves one day this week. And the words, God, that were spoken today would ring in their heart. And they'd finally understand Pastor Mike was preaching to me. He may not know it. He was preaching to me. Father, I'm asking you, God, to deal with your people and say things to them that I cannot say. But, Father, keep us. Not only keep us as your own, but keep us out and away from the things in this world. And get us in our hearts back where we need to be with you. Bless and honor your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. God bless you this morning. Watch out for that heat. Uh, we ought to have somebody go out and start everybody's car for them. Just to cool it off, right? All right. Come back at 3 o'clock. You're dismissed. <laughs>